Please welcome our guest speaker, Mr. Rory Underwood, MBE. <laughs> Evening, everyone. That's better. I can assure you now that hell will freeze over before I sing to you. Okay? <laughs> Don't worry about it. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, honoured guests, ladies and gentlemen. Very pleased to be here tonight. Now, it's fascinating because A, it's a mixed dinner, and B, there is quite a range of age uh, within this room. Why do I say that? People always tell you when you're doing public speaking, you should never apologize, but I always start in this sense. Uh, I do apologize, uh, but I'm sorry my mother couldn't be here tonight. Right, that gives me a gauge, because half the audience are going, what the hell is he talking about his mother for? And let's face it, the rest of you, do you remember that image of my mother on TV? Yeah, still not sure. The reason I raise this subject up is because whenever I speak to audiences like yourselves for the first time, one of the famous adages or um, mantras I always have from the um, uh, Royal Air Force is never assume check. And I'm minded because when I was growing up uh, at school, one of my sporting heroes was a gentleman called Daley Thompson. Does everybody here know who Daley Thompson is? <laughs> the sad thing is half the people in here are so young they'll go, no, I don't. And that, every time I ask that question, it gets further and further from saying yes. So when I grew up and uh, left school in 81, Daly had just won his first gold medal in 1980 at Moscow. Well done. He won his second gold medal in 1984 in Los Angeles. You're starting to get into this, this audience participation, okay. So he won his gold medal. Now, in what, you may ask? He won the gold medal in the decathlon. Does everybody know what the decathlon is? Okay, just to check, never assume. Okay, 10 sports over two days in the Olympics. Four track, six field events. Got it? So let's be honest, it's a real effort. It's a real challenge to win the gold medal in the decathlon. Would you all agree? So not, thank you. So not only to win the gold medal in 1980 in Moscow, but also in 1984 in Los Angeles. And let's be honest, for those of you who saw him, whistling to the national anthem on the podium at Los Angeles. When he came back, he was not only the most famous sportsman, he was the most famous British person in the world at that time. And I remember playing in a golf tournament, met him, was really pleased to go and say hello to him and, and meet him and what's it like in his accolade, because I was just starting on my sporting career. And talking to him about what it feels like, what's it, how do you get cope with all the attention, all that sort of stuff. And he said, it's great, you get used to it, and you have to Certain times you've got to make sure you're doing you know, the right things and say the right things. But he said, however, he said he was doing this interview with a very well-known ladies magazine, which all of you here will have read at some point, and the blokes will admit to it even in the doctor's surgery, but Cosmopolitan, reading something there and that. This young female reporter asked him the very first question, two weeks after he came back from winning the gold medal in Los Angeles for the second time in the decathlon, when she said to him, so Daly, how far can you throw the decathlon then? <laughs> Never assume check. Now what I do by asking that first question about my mother is to find out generally who here follows rugby, and also of the certain age that you are that remember that image of my mother doing the one person Mexican wave in the West Stand at Twickenham. For those of you that remember that, that was in 1993. Does that make you feel old? For those of you who are very young, it makes you feel very young. 1993, when she was seen doing that. And it's quite interesting, around that point in 1993, I'd been in the Air Force 10 years. And it's quite interesting, because I, when I come to these events, I often get the, I mean, it's nice to see, you know, sportsmen, aviator, and businessmen. And it's the fact that whenever I go anywhere, a lot of people remember me from my rugby playing days and don't actually remember that I actually had a job. And for those who only know rugby as it is now, I have to remind them that the game only turned professional in 1995-96. And the best way of describing it was, 
I had a job as a pilot in the Royal Air Force. And in my spare time, as a hobby, I played rugby. It's as simple as that. For those of you remember, I played in the World Cup final in 1991, which is a strange, interesting concept because it was a highlight for me. I can say I'm one of a few people that played in a rugby World Cup fi final at Twickenham in 1991. It was also a low light because the flipping Australians beat us, 12-6. However, we played at 3 o'clock on that Saturday afternoon, November the 5th, 1991. Monday morning at 8 o'clock, I was at RF Witten near uh, uh, Huntingdon, uh, back at Metbrief to go flying that afternoon. That's the way it was in those days. Now, if I take you back to what it was like when I first, because one of the questions I get asked a lot is, so in those days, how did you find out you got selected to play for your country? Let's face it, it's anybody here who plays sport of some description, if you had the chance to play for your country, you'd grab the chance. I was, and the other thing I like and enjoy about this is I'm speaking to a local audience. I live just down the road at Allington, just down the A1 near Grantham. But of course, having joined the Air Force, I've become an honorary yellow belly because RF Lincolnshire is littered with uh, RAF stations, as you know. Now, I was starting at Cranwell, started flying training. I was playing so much rugby, they decided to farm me off up to a small little air base called Swinderby. I think you've heard of it, yeah? So they farmed me off there, and I had to look after the airman recruit training. In those days, this is 1984, recruit, airman recruit training was based at Swinderby, those will know, okay? And I was in charge of one of the flights there. And uh, so I was allowed to go off and play the rugby and forget about my flying training as was in those days. And this particular uh, weekend, which is very memorable for the reason that I found out I was playing for England, I was on a Sunday night in the mess at Iris Swinderby. I just played on the Saturday, uh, came back, I was a singly, 20 years old, living in the mess, just passing the time on a Sunday. And that Sunday evening was a standard ITV film. So it was starring um, James Coburn in the film, Our Man Flint. Some of you know it? Yeah, nothing important about it, but that's the memory I have of that particular evening. I was sitting there in the armchair watching the film, eight o'clock, I don't know what time it was, something like that. And the phone rang, and the um, door opened, and heard the uh, steward coming from the bar, saying, ah, oh, sir, I've been looking for you. There's a telephone call for you. So I said, oh, right. So I wandered through into the bar, picked the phone, acting part of us Rory Underwood here, and his voice boomed out. Rory, how the devil are you? Derek Morgan here. Now, none of you know who the hell Derek Morgan is. However, at the time, Derek Morgan was the then chairman of England Selectors. So I met him a few times. Now, why was he ringing me in the middle of February, halfway through the Five Nations? England had played Scotland the week before, up at Murrayfield, and lost. So it was rather strange, going through the pleasantries of, hello, how you doing, what's going on, that sort of stuff. And they eventually threw me this question. So what are you doing next weekend on Saturday, Rory? I said, um, uh, I've got uh, Gloucester at home at Welford Road with Tigers. He said, all oh, right. He said, what have I said to you that you're playing alongside Dusty Hare, Clive Woodward, Paul Dodge, Les Cusworth, Nick Youngs, and Peter Wheeler. Now, most of you in here, I suspect, know a few things about Leicester Tigers, and will know all of them were Leicester Tigers, but at the time, they were all playing for England. So either what he was saying to me was that I'd been picked to play for England, or they'd all been dropped, and I was playing with them with Leicester. <laughs> so I remember saying to him, I think I, think I know what you're saying, Derek, but speak to me English. Exactly what, what do you mean? He said, Rory... Congratulations, you've been selected to play for England next Saturday at Twickenham HQ against the old Paddies. Well done, mate. So suffice to say, I had a rather large grin on my face. I said, brilliant, yeah, thanks, great. Oh, I can't believe this, fantastic. Oh, I said, right, the formalities. He said, be at Starbridge at 6.30 Monday night, training. Yeah, sure, I'll be there. I didn't know where the hell Starbridge was, but I said, I'll be there. We're meeting at 12.30 at the Petersham Hotel in Richmond. Be there, we'll train Thursday afternoon. We'll have a light captain's run out on Friday morning, and then we'll play against the old paddies on Saturday afternoon, okay? I said, yep, no problem. I'll get Saturday, uh, fr Thursday and Friday off work. I'm sure that's not a problem. Great, so we'll see you Monday at 6.30 at Starbridge. Yep, no problem. Oh, Rory, one other thing. Yes, Derek, what is it? We're not announcing the side until tomorrow, 10.30, in a press conference at Twickenham. So until then, you're not allowed to tell anybody about this. I said, right, okay, got, got the picture. He said, so I'll see you established tomorrow. I said, yeah, fine.
put the phone down. So I walked back into the TV room, I sat back down in my armchair, and I carried on watching Our Man Flint with James Coburn. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm 20 years old, I've just been picked to play my chosen sport for my country at Twickenham next Saturday in front of 65,000 people. Oh my God, oh sorry, in modern parlance, OMG. I must have been in a daze for about two hours. I can't tell you what happened in that film. Mulling over this concept that I was going to be playing for England next week. When after a while, I said, sod this for a game of soldiers. I'm going to tell my mother about this. So I walked back into the uh, bar, went to the bar. In those days, before we had um, mobile phones, 5p, was it expensive? That? 5p into the old uh, public phone, rang my mother up. Hi, Mum, it's Rory. <gasps> Rory, I can't believe it. You're playing for England. You're playing for England. I can read the other line saying, Mum, how the hell did you find out I'm playing for England? It's supposed to be top secret. She said, yes, but Derek Morgan rang me for your telephone number. <laughs> so ever since then, my mum's always known what I've been doing at least two weeks before I ever did. Now, the wonderful thing about um, playing sport at the highest level is the general public, coming used to it. Now, let's be honest, I started playing in 1984. We didn't really become well-known people until 91, 92, when we made the World Cup final in 91 and started winning the Grand Slams. For those who remember, the Will Carling era. So really, from 1984 until 91-ish, me walking downtown Grantham was not really an issue with regards to crowd trouble, etc. Let's be honest. Grantham is not exactly the bedrock and center of English rugby in England. We all know that, okay? Neither's Newark, okay? Neither's Newark. So wandering down the high street is not really an issue for me, and even nowadays it isn't. But I remember playing in a game against Scotland in 1990. The Scots amongst you will remember that day very fondly. A, because we let you win it every 10 years, and B, because you beat us and you won the Grand Slam that year. So suffice to say, we got slagged off in the press, papers were writing about us, all that sort of stuff. And it was interesting coming to terms with not only the performance for you as a person, as a team, your supporters, but also the press and getting slagged off by the press. And I, my wife and I shot off to Paris for a few days on holidays, a few uh, days we had to spare before uh, the birth of my first daughter. And um, I spread the French papers. I can't speak French, didn't understand a single word of French, didn't make any difference. But I flew back into uh, East Midlands, went back home, and I popped into Grantham to go and open an account at the Halifax. If you're uh, opposite uh, sort of banking institution, I do apologize, but it doesn't make a difference. So I wandered in, in the queue, waiting to do my um, uh, transaction. This old gentleman finished doing his business at the uh, cashier desk, walked, walked past me towards the door, counting his money. And as he walked past me, he just happened to glance up and look at me and took a second look. And as he was walking to the door, you could see him, kept on going, like this, and I thought, I don't believe it. <laughs> it's 1990, and I've just been recognized in Grantham. Unbelievable. And as he was walking to the door, you could see him, and he was obviously just trying to pluck up the courage to come and ask me for my autograph. And he stopped, thought about it, I'm thinking, I can't believe it, I've been recognized, and he's been asking for an autograph. Unbelievable. So eventually plucked up the courage, he walked straight up to me, got as close as this, looked me in the eye, and he said, well, you sport my Saturday afternoon, didn't you? And walked off. <laughs> so I've been coming to terms with England supporters was an interesting challenge. Now, this is the first time I've been to Kellam Hall. Lovely, lovely building. Lovely dinner. It's been a great evening so far. I mean, you've got to enjoy the three waiters. Can anybody sing like that? I can't sing like that. I'm tone deaf. Wonderful occasion. Business awards. You know, the whole context of either individuals or teams or businesses all coming together to celebrate success within business, as well as the chance for all of you to network and gloat when you win your... Was that somebody asking a question? Sorry? Oh, is that somebody outside? Sorry. Oh, it's the, it's the staff, yeah. Um, to celebrate the whole occasion. Now, can you imagine the real challenge we have in the game of rugby, that as much as we like to be in a position, and as was mentioned by Mervyn, the whole 
concept of playing sport in a team sport and bring the business and, and that's what I do now in my business. But fundamentally, I've got to bring you into a bit of a little secret that as much as it is a team game, we have the challenge that is there with every single sport in the context of rugby, whereby how the hell do you deal with the average donkey, i.e. the forwards? I've had the pleasure of traveling all over the world with the game of rugby. Actually, I could say a bit of a challenge. I've been to uh, Australia four times on tour. I've uh, been to South Africa twice. A bit of sympathy for going on. I've been to New Zealand. And that was eight weeks in the winter. That was a real challenge, I tell you. Um, oh, and I tell you what, I had to slum it twice, in fact, twice in Fiji. Uh, anyway, the reason I bring that up is uh, anybody here been to New Zealand? Anybody from New Zealand? No? Anybody been to New Zealand? A few hands. Okay. Those of you in New Zealand will, will back me up here. It takes roughly 24 hours to get from London to Auckland. 24 hours in an aircraft. How the hell do you keep a bunch of donkeys occupied for 24 hours in an aircraft? Now, this is where military training came into operation. Each back is allocated a donkey. It is the responsibility of the back to ensure the donkey gets through the airport, departure lounge, and find themselves to the gate. Once on the aircraft, it is the responsibility of the back to ensure that the donkey finds his way to the seat by deciphering the new alphanumeric code on the ticket. Once in the seat, obviously the donkey's got no chance with its hooves to do up the uh, seat belt. Not that they could work it out anyway. So the back has to do the seat belt up for him. So once the captain checks, are all the donkeys strapped in securely? All the donkeys stra safely strapped in. Captain's happy to start the engines and start taxiing out for takeoff. While we're taxiing out down the taxiway, this is where the forwards are a bit amused. They get occupied because they all start playing Simple Simon with the uh, stewardesses and the um, things that come down. They get all excited and wonder whether that mass that comes down, they get excited about that because they think it's on tap beer going to come down. And judging by the audience, I've got the next one because they get all very excited about the stewardess when she starts blowing on the end of the tube. I don't know why. but um, So we get to the end of the runway. Captain's about to take off. Are we all happy, secure? Yes. Great. We'll get airborne. Four Rolls-Royce engines get powered up, powers down the runway, get airborne. We get airborne, the forwards still can't understand why they can't get out of their seat, what this invisible force field is holding them in. We try and explain to them it's safety, you can't get out of your seat until the seatbelt sign goes off. So they sit there watching the seatbelt sign. After half an hour, the seatbelt sign goes off, and they still can't understand why they can't get out of the seat. So back leans over, undoes the seatbelt. Well, that's half an hour gone. We've got 23 and a half hours to go to New Zealand. Well, that's fine, because all the donkeys start herding towards the galley in all three galleys in the aircraft, and they start drinking the galley dry of alcohol. Well, that takes another hour and a half. <laughs> so two hours have gone, no alcohol on the aircraft, 22 hours to get to go to New Zealand. One of them has a brainwave and says, I oh, know, let's play mastermind. You know mastermind with those colored pins? You've got to guess which color they are. You seen that again? Yeah? That lasted two minutes. They couldn't cope with the hooves trying to move those things around. So one of them, now Brian Moore. Does anybody know Brian Moore? Some of you, the young ones won't know. Brian Moore, pit bull. Okay? Fair enough, he's got a few more average brain cells than the average donkey, okay? He was getting a bit annoyed with this and thought, I can't cope with this for 22 hours. So he thought, right, I'm going to ask you a question. This will keep you going all the way to Auckland. He said, I don't know how many seconds there are in a minute or an hour. In fact, I don't want to know how many seconds there are in a day, a week, or a month. What I want to know is, how many seconds are there in a year? And that was pretty much their response. Okay? So Brian goes back to his uh, business class seat, reclines the seat, puts his eye patches, earplugs in thought, Auckland, here I come. 
So all the donkeys start getting their hooves out, start counting. One, two, four comes after two, so three. So two minutes of trying to count past five, sweat pouring out of the forwards. But eventually this voice pipes up. I got the answer. Moro takes his eye patches and earplugs off and says, who said that? He said, me, Jace. Jason Leonard. Do you know Jason Leonard? A leg end in his own lifetime. 114 caps as prop for England. Amazing. Now, people know about my mother and a bit of a character. Jason Leonard's mum's no different. She told me this story when he was a young lad. He was a chippies lad when he was starting to work. He used to play for Barking Rugby Club in North London. She used to pack his lunchbox for him. She had to make sure that the lunchbox was a see-through one. That was so he could work out whether he was going to work or from. Okay. So I can all the backs explain that one to the forwards. There is another one. So Jason says, I got the answer. So he says, uh, go on then, tell me what the answer is. He says, 12. Jace, how the hell did you work out there are only 12 seconds in a year? I'm going to regret asking this, but tell me, how the hell did you work there are only 12 seconds in a year? He said, well, it's easy, he said. He said, 2nd of January, 2nd of February, 2nd of March. So you can imagine with 22 hours to go, the next 22 hours flew by. But the backs, we had a secret plan. For those who remember the old AV system on a long haul flight on BA, Channel 18, we told them it's a great film. Watch Channel 18, it'll keep you occupied for the next 22 hours. It's this story about an aircraft that gets airborne out of Heathrow, follows the blue line, and gets to Auckland. They loved it, kept them occupied. <laughs> Bless them, the old forwards, we love them. The old adage, forwards win games, and the backs by how much, actually isn't far from the truth. And it is, it's the wonderful thing, that's part of the banter we have. Now, the interesting concept about the old flying from getting airborne, I mean, when I first started flying, and that's what got me into the Air Force, I remember when I was, um, the youngest memory I have of, of flying, we used to go in a VC-10 out of London, Frankfurt, Rome, uh, Cairo, um, Muscat, uh, somewhere up in Karachi, Colombo, Bangkok, KL, to go back home. That was a you know, two-hour legs every single time. And in those days, you used to get off every time. So you can imagine how long it took to get from uh, London to KL. But that's what got me into flying. What got me into flying was the fact that when you're a passenger in an aircraft, do you see the world of flying out through this little small little fishbowl on the right here? And that's all it is. And I used to sit there wondering, what is it like out the front when you're actually coming into land or when you're getting airborne? That's what got me into flying. That was the whole fascination, as simple as that. And it was a bit of a toss-up between becoming a BA pilot or becoming an Air Force pilot. But the Air Force uh, recruitment video pretty much won it for me when the guy in the Jaguar flying along said, well, you can't do a loop the loop in a jumbo jet. That took it for me. Well, you can, but you spill everybody's G&Ts all over the place. To give you some sort of idea, I've talked about rugby quite a lot and some of my experience with rugby, but I just want to leave you with one story from my flying days to give you an essence of what it's like uh, for me when I went flying uh, in my time in the Air Force. As I said, I did my basic flying training at Cranwell. Uh, I was at uh, Swindeby for about six weeks, eight weeks while I was playing rugby through the five, five nations before I went back to finish off my flying training. I ended up going to Valley, uh, RAF Valley in Anglesey. So I went to Anglesey in 1985, so I'm 22. I go and fly the Hawk. Now those of you who see the contrails in the skies over Lincoln most days uh, at the moment uh, at RF Scampton will know the Red Arrows are based at RF Scampton and they fly the Hawk. So that's what I was flying as a basic, sorry, an advanced trainer at RF Valley. So to give you some sort of idea what it's like, I'll give you an example of a trip once I'd got to the stage where I qualified solo on a Hawk. I went to do a low-level sortie on my own as a solo 22-year-old. And metaphorically speaking, they'd give me the keys to this Hawk. So I'd go to the engineers, I'd check the engineering log, it's like looking at the logbook to see what uh, work's been done on it, check it's all signed and everything, it's got enough fuel, oxygen, oils, sort of fairly important stuff. Sign it and say, I accept the aircraft. The aircraft is now mine. I walk out to the aircraft, get into my ejection seat, 
sat inside the aircraft. For anybody who's interested, the ejection seat in a Hawk is what we call a zero, zero seat. If you are sat on the ground and you pull the handle, you will survive the ejection. I know there was a fatality two, three years ago, and that was a very, very sad occasion of two um, emergencies happening one after the other. But fundamentally, that seat, if you pull the handle and you're sat here, like you are now in your seat, two, three seconds later, you will hit uh, the parachute opening and then hit the ground. You will survive. So I got airborne at my Hawk, climbed up to 43,000 feet out of RAF Valley, flying due south. I ended up going at high level. At 43,000 feet, you're going just above you lot, going on holidays. Most of the airlines, the jumbos and the 380s and the 340s, they'll fly at about low 30s, 35, 36 max. So I fly down, I drop into low level at Land's End. I want to say low level, for those of you who have the chance to see an aircraft flying level, an aircraft flying at low level in peacetime is flying at 250 feet off the ground. When people say to me, I saw an aircraft flying the other day, it was really low, I say, because it's really low. And 250 feet is 80 meters. If you put a rugby or football pitch on end, you will fly underneath the top posts. That is how low you are. And you are doing 420 knots. You're doing seven miles a minute. That's how fast you're going when you're flying a Hawk at low level. So I drop into Land's End. I fly up through Cornwall, it, into Devon, across the Channel, into Viet Taf land, fly up through uh, Wales, ending up landing back at uh, RF Valley. And the wonderful thing about that is you've had the wonderful thing of seeing the whole of the UK from so high and seeing both sides of the coast, as well as being that low level at 420 knots at 250 feet, and all that sortie took you one hour, 15 minutes. That gives you, a, hopefully, an, an example of what my office was like. That's what my office world was like for 18 years while I was in the Royal Air Force. Very proud of being in the Royal Air Force, and very proud of the people I worked with and the people that made me get airborne in a safe aircraft and also fly safely with my other colleagues in the formation if required. And during that time is when I brought out and come into civilian life. Don't get me wrong, there are things that we do in the Air Force that wouldn't work in civilian life as there is the other way around. But a lot of the skill set that I learned from the Royal Air Force holds true for me now. It was a wonderful experience, 3,000 hours. Of those 18 years, I flew for 15. Well, technically I flew for 18 years, but for three years I flew a desk, which is what we call with a desk job when you fly a desk. Not the fun time when you're a pilot flying. But that's to give you some sort of background of where I've come from uh, in my first tranche of my career. And it's been a great, great journey. And the work I'm doing now, working with companies, is you know, why I accept the, you know, the offer to come and speak tonight with regards to seeing people, individuals, parts of businesses and companies that are doing great things. Being success, success in the local community as well as being success nationally, but then being recognized when you come here. So in finishing off, can I wish everybody that's been nominated every congratulations. Can I wish all those that have won um, congratulations even more so. But like anything else with those in sport who aspire to be at the highest level, in fact, the easy thing is to win something. The hardest thing to do is actually go out there and win it again. And for your aspirations to be Usain Bolt, win it year on year, to be Delhi Thompson, win it twice in a row, that is the real challenge. So don't let the foot off the pedal. Keep working hard. Enjoy it, especially enjoy tonight, because it's a wonderful occasion. And take all the accolades that you deserve. Thank you very much.